Hebrews chapter number 12. We'll begin reading in verse number 14. The Bible says, Follow peace with all men in holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up troubleth you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know that for you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for another opportunity to come to your house tonight. Lord, I just pray that uh, you bring back to my remembrance the uh, things that I've studied. Lord, I pray that you put a hedge around my mind and a bridle about my tongue. And Lord, I pray that uh, you'd use this unworthy vessel to help your people. And Lord, I pray you get all the praise, honor, and glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Now, in these verses... Off times in the teens class, Zach will tell you it's his favorite game to play. We play the definition game. That's where I pick one of the words out of the verse, that it's very important to understand that word in order to understand the verse. And then they spend about five minutes trying to give me the definition of it until most of the time I have to give them the definition of it. And the thing that's difficult, it's not that they don't know what these words mean. It's that words in English have a whole lot of different meanings. Right? In biblical days, there was a word and that word meant a thing. Right, whether it was Greek, whether it was Hebrew, is very specific because our God is a specific God. And then you, that's why you've got to be diligent to study. You've got to get the context to the verse in order to understand what's going on. You just can't pick a verse out of the Bible and then create a doctrine on it, but that's a whole different lesson, and I don't have time to get into all that tonight. But in verse number 14, we see that the writer of Hebrews says, Follow peace with all men. I mean, that's a, that's a hard thing to do sometimes. Peace with all men. What's that? It means no conflict. Right. It means that there's nothing hindering a relationship between you and that person. Amen. How did Christ live his life? Well, did he rub people the wrong way? Yeah, but that's because people didn't want to accept what he was saying. Sure. Those were the Pharisees. Those were the Sadducees. Those were the scribes. But those that came unto him and listened to what he had to say, you always find that there was peace between them and Jesus. I mean, after all, didn't Isaiah call him the Prince of Peace? He was peace. And therefore, as children of God, just like Brother Clinton sang the song, we got adopted in, we should also be peaceful like our Heavenly Father. Sure. I mean, but then we get into follow peace with all men. And this is the one that gives us more trouble. Holiness. That definition game. What's holiness? Well, holiness, synonym, sanctification, means consecration or purification and it means sanctified of heart and life. Well, sanctification means that you were set aside for the use of God. Sure. When things in the temple were put in the temple, they had to be sanctified. There were offerings that were put up over those instruments. There was a cleansing process that had to go through it. And once it was in the house of God, it meant nobody could use that except for God's honor and glory. You just didn't go into God's house and get to use those silver and gold bowls or get to use the pitchers that they kept the oil in so that they could keep the lamp burning at all times during the house of God. No, those were God's. But what is a holy life? A holy life is one that's been purified, meaning first saved, but then second, continually. Right, if any man needs forgiveness, we can be forgiven. We talked about that in Sunday school this morning. Right, if we ask for forgiveness, thankfully, he's faithful to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If we repent, he'll forgive it. He will cleanse us again. But it's the sanctification where we say, I'm going to do only what God wants me to do. That's where a lot of people nowadays lack when it comes to holiness. It's not that they don't know how to be clean. It's not that they're not clean. It's that they've allowed themselves or they use themselves for things other than God's honor and glory. Amen. But then... The contingency on verse number 14, without which no man shall see the Lord. You want to see God show up in your life? You want to see God show up in the church? It takes holiness. Holiness takes effort. Holiness takes sacrifice. Not of, you know, wicked, I mean, not of wicked things, not of things that are against the law. It may just be TV time. It may be the internet. It may be putting down one of your favorite books. It may be spending a little extra time in prayer. I don't know what it is, but there's a 
bright line in our life where God says that's what I want you to be and I will remind you you can find it in both Old and New Testament be ye holy for I am holy Amen. we should be like our heavenly father yeah. okay but then verse number 15 he says looking diligently what does diligently mean it means that there's no space for error if you do something diligently you're dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's you've got all the bases covered in other words, be on the lookout in your own life. As Peter wrote, for your adversary, the devil, walking about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We ought to always be on guard and protect that holiness. Sure. Lest any of you first, a root of bitterness spring up. It says that many thereby were defiled. Out of bitterness. Well, and then it goes on in verse number 16. It says, lest there be any fornicator or profane person. Well, let's stop a second. What's profane person mean? Well, it means an unruly person, an unhallowed person, an ungodly person. What's that? It's the opposite of holiness. That's what profane is. Well, what is a fornicator? Well, it's somebody that metaphorically was a debauchee, meaning they went out and lived a life spiritually of all kinds of indecency and immorality. Okay, it's the, the literal, literal term, fornicator means a male prostitute. So spiritually you're going out and selling yourself for whatever pleasures in the flesh you can reap as a result of it. And then the example that he gives is Esau. He says Esau was one of them fornicators, one of them that was profane. Why? He was born into the right family. I mean, his father was Isaac. The promised child that God had given to Abram. And then eventually he was born and it was Abraham. Right? The one that Abraham was willing to sacrifice, we find just a few chapters before this, by faith believed that God would raise him up from the dead if he did have to sacrifice him. Because God promised him to him. Right, that one, the one who went in the winter in times of drought would redig the wells of his father and saw, yep, God was good back then, he's still good now. Right, through all that their family faced, God was all over their lives. And Esau, who was raised in that family, sold his birthright for one morsel of meat. Now, I've thought on this before. Back in, that was what they call, in biblical terms, the time of the patriarchs. Okay? That was before the law had come that was before Moses got the Ten Commandments came down off the mountain right what did they live off of they lived off of what Adam and Eve were taught in the garden and it was handed down through generations in order to learn how to be godly first off had to come from those that did as God told Adam to do as, able to, as Seth eventually did Right, and that was passed down through their children. Then eventually it gets down to where Noah's the only one left on the earth doing it. So then to get to this point, if you, you know, to Esau, where'd he learn it from? Well, he learned it from Noah and his descendants that got off of the ark that knew firsthand how good God was. Right, there was no Bible back then. It was handed down from generation to generation. And you know what part of the birthright was? It was a blessing as part of the birthright that you were the one that was in charge spiritually of the family. You were the family priest. You were the one that would go out and make the sacrifices for the house. You were the one that was obligated but also honored to hand down what God had given to your father before you and now you get to teach the rest of them. He wasn't just trading his inheritance. Because also with the birthright, you got a double portion compared to everybody else, but there was a price for that. You were spiritually and then also physically responsible for the family. Amen. You were the one that was in charge. You had to take care of, if your mother lived on past your father, had to take care of your mother, had to take care of siblings, had to take care of the father's estate, which was now your estate. But with that also, spiritually, you were in charge. That's why, I mean, you go back into the Old Testament and times of the If a father started doing wrong, the Bible tells us sin carried out to the third and fourth generation. 
It's no accident that those that disobeyed the Lord, they weren't the ones that got on the ark. Right? They weren't the ones that afterward found favor in the eyes of God, that they were the ones that God chose to make a great nation out of, where his seed would number more than the stars. Why were those people chosen? Because they kept those things that God had given, and they were dear to them. They didn't see them as obligations. They saw it as a blessing. I get to be holy before God. I get to be peaceable among all men. I get to walk hand in hand with God. So with that thought in mind, tonight we're going to preach on bartering your blessings. Bartering your blessings. Because what did Esau do? He bartered his blessing. For one morsel of meat, sold his birthright. And what happened when he bartered it away? Verse number 17. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he would have, should have been that way, could have been that way, it was his, but then he sold it. He bartered it. Why? To appease one of those urges of the flesh. Hunger. He would have, but he couldn't, because he gave it away. God didn't take it from him. It's God's will for him to inherit it, but he didn't want it. It wasn't as valuable to him as one piece of jerk he was. As a thing that he was a hunter. He should have had plenty of jerky stocked up. I mean, I've said it before. You're a bad hunter if you go out to hunt only when you don't have food. You go out to hunt daily. Not taking for granted the blessings of God. Lord, I know that you gave me a deer yesterday, but Lord, I don't know when the next one's coming, so I'm going to go out and I'm going to bait. I'm going to go out and study. I'm going to go out and look at where they're feeding nowadays. I might drop some seed on the ground. Esau waited until he didn't have no food left, and then by the time he came back, he was so hungry, he said, you can have everything that God's ever given me for one piece of meat. God wanted him to have it. He didn't want it. And then it says... For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. He eventually regretted it, but he didn't regret it at the time. Amen. He realized afterwards what he had done, but he couldn't go back and he couldn't take it back. Now, thankfully, God is long suffering. Thankfully, his mercies endure forever. You can be forgiven for it, but sometimes you still got to pay the price. Sometimes that root of bitterness, when it gets plucked out, it's going to leave a scar. Sometimes, if we commit spiritual fornication, if we're profane after we know what the right thing is to do, we're going to have some things that we have to carry with us. Whether they're memories, whether it's people's opinions that remember, whether it's those that try to drag up the past. Esau wouldn't have had to worry about that if he didn't sell his birthright. You study it out, Esau's generations, all the way out, they were known as Edom. They were subjects of Israel. They weren't slaves, but they weren't citizens. They paid Israel in wool every year to be their protectors, because they could not protect themselves. They realized that our ancestor sold, and we could have what you had, but because of what he did, we can't have what Israel has. Because Jacob was the one that inherited the blessing, not Esau. Amen. Amen. Esau cried all they want to. His descendants could cry all they want to. Is done. Amen. They could get close to it, but they could never really get in to being one of the chosen people of God. Right, well, first off, when it comes to bartering your blessings, what's it talk about in verse number 15 when it says, Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. What do you have to trade away in order to get bitter? You've got to trade away your affection. Doesn't the Bible say that the world will know that we're his disciples because we have love one for another? Sure. Even those that weren't living right, what did Jesus show them? Love. Because he is love. We talked about that in Sunday school too. I didn't even know I was going to be teaching on this tonight. But hey. Right, we look at everything that God has done. It was out of love. 
It was out of love for his creation that he didn't destroy Adam and Eve in the garden. It was out of love for his creation that long before he made them, he knew that his son would be the propitiation for their sin. It was out of love that he draws us with loving kindness to come unto him. He doesn't beat us over the head. He, doesn't put, he may chastise us, but what's that? That's a correction. That's not punishment. Because if God punished us and gave us what we deserved, we'd be in hell even today. It's a correction. Why? Because he loves us. But then also, because of that love, we get great blessings. Right? We ought to be blessings to others through the love that we have for others. But what's it take to keep the love of Christ in our life? You got you to kill off part of yourself. Anybody in here besides me selfish? I don't want to do that. Why? Because I don't want to. If I don't want to do it, what's the point in doing it? Right? I'm going to be miserable. Why in the world would I? Do? Because I'm not thinking about well, that, but I'm not thinking about what it means to other people. I don't know why people would want to hang out with me, but my grandparents like to. I don't know. And I get chewed out if I don't go and, you know, eat dinner with them like once every month or something. Well, it's because they just want to be around their grandkid. Right? Doesn't matter that I've been at work all day long or, you know, I've been judging a debate tournament all day Saturday and I'm numb in my brain by the time I get there and I don't want to go or I've got a sign that said that. Doesn't matter. That's family. Yep. Right? That's Ma and Paul. Yep. I'm going to go see them. Why? Because I love them. But see, as Christians, it's very easy to let the flesh rear up and say, no, nah, I don't want to. Why? Because I don't love them. Right, you start, let's take Jordan again as the example. You start sitting down and realizing, well, hey, first off, I was the first grandkid, so I got spoiled real good before any of them, for about five year, four or five years before Christian showed up. And then I've still been spoiled ever since. Right, because they love me. But I mean, you just start sitting down and think, well, hey, all they want to do is go out to dinner and they've done all that. I mean, it ought to make us feel guilty when we don't show the love of God to others that God has shown to us. We ought to get under conviction for that. But we've got to sell that part of us off and barter it so that we can be bitter. Long before somebody gets bitter, they've already lost the love of God in their heart. Amen. And why did they barter it off? Because what does barter mean? It means that you take something that you know is valuable and you trade it for the best offer. You're not selling it because it's not yours. You're pawning it. You're trying to get the best price that you can for it. And many times, with the, the love of God is a blessing. To come in among God's people and feel as if you want... You're not going to feel one around God's people. You may be saved, may be on your way to heaven, but you're not going to feel a part of the family if you've lost the love of God. You're ostracizing yourself. That's what happened to Esau. After Esau sold his birth, after his father wished he could bless him, but he had already blessed Jacob, Esau, you find, split from Jacob. He wasn't a part of the family no more. He had the name, but he wasn't living like part of the family. He wasn't there at dinner time. He wasn't there day in and day out with his nieces and nephews. You know why? Because Esau, long before, I mean Esau being our example in these verses, long before Esau ever went out and sold his birthright, he went out and married strange wives. His love for the things of God, he traded it off for literal love in the flesh. And he knew better. What did God tell Abram? He said, hey, your boy Isaac, go back among your people. Find him a wife there. Don't let him do any... We, throughout the rest of the Bible, right? One of the things, don't marry a woman from another land. Why? Because of their religion. They will entice the one that is married away from God rather than the one that's right with God enticing them to God. Sure. Very seldom do you find someone that was saved leading one that was lost that they get married to to Christ. It's usually the other way around. It's usually when two lost people are married, one of them gets saved, then they might be able to get the other one saved. The Bible says it's possible, but it's very hard. Very hard. Well, Esau got led away a long time before he married them strange wives. He bartered it away. Why? Because he thought, well, hey, maybe, maybe their fathers were rich. 
Maybe he got a great dowry for marrying them. Maybe they were just really good looking. But Esau, because his heart was wayward on God, he sold off the affection for the things of God, and now he's in a strange land where he has no one. Doesn't have God because he walked out on God. God wanted him to be the one. And God said, you didn't choose me, so I can't choose you. And that bitterness, what is it really? It's we're so miserable. I mean, but Sammy said it. It's poison that we take trying to kill our enemies. When really those enemies, who was Esau's enemy? His own flesh and blood, his brother. Jacob wasn't his enemy, but Esau made him his enemy. His lack of appreciation for the things of God made Jacob, Jacob his enemy. Eventually, his name gets changed to Israel. Right? I mean, you find out, eat them. Every now and then, they try and rear up and fight against them. Against God's people trying to win their own independence. And they're saying, no, we didn't put you there. Esau put you there. It's only by the grace of God that God didn't let you all get wiped off of the map and you still get to be protected by God's people. We're the same way. Well, Lord, what can I get in the world? What could I get just from the time? Instead of praying for people, I could watch more TV. Right? Instead of doing this, what can I get out in the world? And we barter it. What's the best price I can get? Right? I don't need to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. They're more than capable of doing it. All the while, you're robbing yourself of blessing. Amen. Oh, how sweet it is when the brethren dwell in unity. You know what one of the great things about the love of God is? When God's people start loving on one another, God shows up. Sure. In unity, in love, in compassion for one another, God's presence may be revealed. Esau didn't get to hang out with God too much. Why? Because he bartered away his blessing. We do the same. But next, it talks about those that do barter their blessing. Those with bitterness, what's it say? They defile themselves. That word, definition games hack, means literally to dye another color. But when we start bartering our blessings, we start showing ourselves for who we really are. We're not going to be able to sweep it under the rug because we're going to be dyed by the world. Esau was marked because he had red hair. Esau, I mean, you see him, he's a big burly dude. Right? I, in my head, I've always imagined he looked like Hulk Hogan with red hair. Right? I don't know if that's true or not, but that's the way that I saw him. Right? He's a manly man. Jacob wasn't. Right? But Esau was. But see, he was marked. I mean, if he was like Saul, who was head and shoulders over everybody else, you see the red hair, well, hey, that's Esau. Right? You could spot him. You knew who Esau was. Right? Well, Jacob, as soon as he sees a red hairline coming across the... He knew who Esau was. He was marked. Right? Well, we as Christians, every now and then we come walking in the door and we're marked by the world. We've been defiled by the world. We bear the marks that we haven't repented of. Because we're unrepentant. And all it does is mark us as one that they're going to be a problem. Or Lord, I know that you want to forgive. I know you want to get them back. Lord, they might be a prodigal. They might be somebody that's just backslidden. They might be somebody that's just a little wayward. I don't know. But it's easy to tell. You may not be marked visually, but you're marked by your speech, marked by your actions. You're marked by your motives on why you come. But somebody that's all in, somebody who's sanctified themselves, they just want to show up and see God to worship. Because they've been worshiping all week through His Word, through prayer, through doing and honoring what Christ commanded us to do. Because it's a blessing to be called by God. It's a blessing to be given something, entrusted by the all-holy God of glory to do something for Him. We know that, but we barter it away. Why? What, for what? Well, it's different for everybody. I want you to look back in verse number 14. It says, follow peace with all men, holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Well, not only do we barter away our affection, right, we also barter away our association. 
Association with who? With God. If we're not peaceful, if we're not holy, what do we lose? The presence of God. We can't see Him. I mean, where is it real quick? Hang on, Isaiah 23, or 26, 3. That will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Where do we get peace? Where do we find holiness? When we stay our mind upon God. Amen. We ought to meditate on the things of God. What's that? That's just keeping in your forefront of your mind, in your consciousness, the things of God. Because it's real easy to get something else where you're focused on it, everything else drowns out. Why do we barter away the opportunity to keep the things of God on our mind? Well, because if I get this job done, I can go home sooner. Well, maybe if I do the job the way that God wants me to do the job, He can get honor and glory from it. Why do we barter away that precious gift of being able to be in constant communication with God? Pray without ceasing. Why do we barter it away? Well, so that we can have this conversation with somebody or so that I can get over here and start talking about how, I, how awful I think my life is. But when my mind stayed upon Him, no, 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 it could be a whole lot worse. I'm blessed that it's this good at all. But when we get our mind off of God, we lose our association. I won't see Him anymore. I can get in here. If my heart's not right with Him, I'm not going to find Him in here. If I'm not right with God, if I don't get in here for His honor and His glory, it's just words on a page. I mean, Brother Bob and I have talked about it a couple of times. Just when them words pop off the page, it looks like it's written in bold, and you go back like a week later, and it's not in bold, but you could have swore it was in bold. I like that. I like getting them verses where I'm like, oh, I never saw that before. What's that? That's me seeing Him in the Bible. Not because I'm special, because He revealed Himself to me. But you're not going to see Him in here. You're not going to see him inside of the church house. You can go, I mean, sometimes we're like Job, where he just pulls himself back a little bit. He said he looked to his left, looked to his right, looked in front of him, couldn't find God. But he knew that God knew where he was. The difference is, when we trade away our peace, when we trade away our holiness, and we don't see him anymore, we're not so sure that God knows where we're at. We don't exercise that faith that Chloe and Miss Brittany sang about. Because we have no faith. Because long before you ever stop loving the things of God, long before you ever stop sanctifying yourself away for the things of God, before you stop being peaceable among all men, not for our sake, but for His sake, when, before you stop doing those things, you've withdrawn your faith. And that's why you lose your association. You can't be one of God's unless you claim to be one of God's. I may have a title... But that doesn't do me much good unless I claim it. I'm not talking name it and claim it doctrine here. Literally. He's made me a king and a priest. Unless I go claim the crown and the robe and use them as God wants me to use them, then they're useless. Doesn't do me any good. Right? I can have the title to a car, but unless I go get it, I've just got a piece of paper. You can have a check, but unless you put it in the bank, you're not going to see the money. Or unless you go cash it. Well, those that by faith say, God wants me to be holy. Well, what's he going to give you in return? He doesn't have to give me anything. He gave me a son. That's good enough for me. But there are blessings. Why? Because he just loves us that much. Because he just pours them out. But, you know, I lose all of that. When I stop coming to church to see him. When I stop praying to see him. When I stop reading the Bible to find his face in the word of God why because one of the commandments seek my face sure. when I stop seeking I'll stop loving the way and there will be contention between me and other people inside a church house outside the church house I'm not going to be peaceable and people aren't going to want to be around me right I know that that might not happen to y'all I'm used to that okay there's just some days it's like okay Jordan's got a whole lot of same paper wrapped around him you just don't don't go near him He's going to rub you the wrong way today. Right, I'm not perfect. But long before we lose that peaceableness, long before we lose that sanctification and holiness before God, we've already withdrawn our faith. Because it's easy to be peaceful when all I'm doing is waiting on God to do something. 
Man, your, your life's a little upside down right now. I mean, it may look like that to you, but God's got it all in control. Yeah, I get that the road looks a little bumpy right now, but hey, he said that I'd mount up on wings as eagles. I don't have to worry about the road when I'm flying. When our mind is not stayed on God, we lose our peace. When we lose our peace, we lose our sanctification. Why? Because we'll barter away the things that used to be valuable to us just for a moment of satisfaction in the flesh. Why? Because when our faith is withdrawn, we're dead spiritually. Doesn't matter how much I used to pray, if I'm not doing it now, it's not helping me. Christianity is not a CD bank account where you put it in and then reap the interest. You're going to reap what you sow, but that means you've got to keep sowing. If you withdraw your faith, it's not going to do you any good. But then finally, okay, verse number 16, there should be any fornicator or profane person. Those are those that they trade away the blessings of God for their carnal advancement. They don't care about the things of God no more. They don't think about the spiritual. They think about the carnal and only the carnal. They are consumed with the natural man and they revert to a state that some, you would think, how is that person ever saved? If you didn't know them when they were saved, you'd look at them and say, I, I, don't, I don't even recognize that person. Surely that can't be the child of God. Esau got to the point you'd think, surely that guy was never born into a family that knew about God let alone the one, the family that God said he would make a chosen generation. Because he bartered away the one thing that God gave him that meant everything in the eyes of God to him. But to him, it was just something that he could barter away. He said, I don't want God. And God said, okay. Because again, the prodigal son, the father didn't come get him out of the hog pen. He had to come to himself. He was in a far country for far longer than he thought he'd be there. He ended up in the hog pen defiling himself under the law just for a meal. He sank lower than he thought he could ever go. Because the last place you should find the Hebrews around pigs. Because they were unholy. They were unclean. They defiled him. But when you become defiled, you're liable to take part in some debauchery. If you don't get back to things, you'll trade away those parts of your mind where used to you had scripture memorized, you've traded it for something else. That part of your heart where used to you would thank your bless, count your blessings, you'll clean that room out of your blessings of God and you'll trade them for whatever the world give, them, give you for them. See, here's the thing. Satan's got a pawn shop. He's willing to accept anything. Because he knows he gets one hook in you, he can just draw you in a little bit closer and a little bit closer and a little bit closer. And we get to the point that for one morsel of meat, he sold his birthright. Long before Esau sold his birthright, he started trading away. Yeah, Dad, I'll come and I'll learn the commandments later. Yeah, Dad, we'll, come, we'll cover how to sacrifice that animal at another day. Yeah, I remember we talked about that when I was 14. I remember it. We're good. Right? Well, we treat God the same way. No, Lord, I know that lesson. Well, you may know it, but he wants you, may want you to reaffirm it. He may want you to get it settled so that when the winds and when the rain come, you're not on shifting sands. You're on the rock. Because right now you may have one foot on the rock, but you know what that means? When the wind blows, you're going to be pushed off of the rock because the other foot isn't going to land there. He's saying, well, you're in, but you're not all in. What did he tell the church to lay out a seat? Because you, thou art neither cold nor hot. He'd spew them out of their mouth. They say, I want you all in. And at every beck and call of God, we say, later, tomorrow, another time, until we go fall back on it. And well, I got a decision to make. Esau's in a tough spot. He's starving. He thought he's going to die if he didn't get something to eat. Right? Praise the Lord, I've never been there. Cannot say that I know what that feels like. But Esau did. And because the things of God, little by little, he stopped valuing them as much, he gave away the most important thing. But what's that for us? That'd be a testimony. Yeah. What is our birthright 
once we were born in Christ to be associated with God well we've already lost our association but that doesn't mean we can't get it back but if you blow your testimony it's going to cost you a whole lot publicly where other people know about it where there's no taking back what you said or what you did where for all of eternity that avenue that God wanted open may be closed off and you can't reach that person you blow it just like Esau he couldn't claim it again what does that mean? Well, it means that it's a very serious business. Why did he give me an association with him? So that I could live a life where people say, that's Jordan. And by the way, Christians didn't invent the term Christians. The world called them that because they lived like Christ. Because they were holy. Because they had peace among themselves and with others. That when they were trying to burn them at the stake for believing in Christ, not renouncing you know, their stance on infant baptism, but what did they do? They were singing hymns. They were quoting Bible verses. They're being slain for the... They had perfect peace. They watched their family die, but they knew they was going to heaven. And then they'd killed the last member of the family. What were they? They were peaceable. Trying to be a testimony for Christ, which still endures to this day. There's still going to be those all the way up through the end. You go and read the book of Revelation. There are going to be those that take a stand and say, nope, I'm, I choose God. In fact, that's how in that dispensation they'll come to salvation. What's that say? The thing that should be most important to us, just like Esau's birthright, is the fact that we can, in the same breath, be mentioned with God's church. Or in association with God's son. But when that doesn't mean anything to us, we're liable to sell that association to the world for whatever we can get. I mean, I've seen, again, I can't judge on didn't walk in life, you know, mile in their shoes. But I don't understand, I understand that it can happen. I don't understand how some of the men of God that have come through over the years preach powerful messages. Now, not even in the ministry. Alcoholics driving UPS trucks. You say, how'd that happen? Well, they bartered some things. I don't understand how, but I know it can happen to me. I desire to restore such one in a spirit of meekness, lest I likewise be tempted. But where's all that start? It starts with that faith. If he is my everything, and if all I have is invested in him, I'm not going to barter anything. Because the words of his holy book are more precious to me than any stone or any gold because the people of God are more precious to me than anything in the world because God chose them like he chose me he fitly framed me together with them so that we could be a heavenly family he knit our hearts together as one so that we could go out as one and impact the community as the body of Christ with Christ being the head but if I start bartering things away I'll let things come between me and my brother or my sister if I start bartering things away, I'll sell out the church to get a moment or to get something temporary in the world because I'm convinced that's what I need. Where's all that start at? Like Brother Josh said this morning, it's a hard problem. And I mean, for years they've said that the journey of a thousand miles starts with one step. But the life to end up like Esau starts with one decision. But we could just get a little cold. We trade one thing off. But I skip reading my devotion today. I'll make up for it tomorrow. Woke up late. I'm running late. Well, if you don't have time for the devotion, put on a preaching tape in the car on the way to work. I know that none of y'all live right next to where you work. Right, well, I'm not going to read today. I'm not going to pray today. Why? Why wouldn't you want to talk to God? I mean, what, who else would you rather talk to? Well, the boss is calling me. Well, boss can wait. I'm talking to Jesus. I'll call him back. Right? Well, you say, well, if I don't pick up, I might get fired. Well, if you get fired for talking to God, obviously God didn't want you to have that job. You think I'm kidding? I mean, 
Maybe that's the thing that God wants. Hey, I want to use you to be a bigger light than ever before on the job. Well, in order to do that, you might have to get fired so that they can prove that the business was wrong. You get rehired. That publicly they have to admit, you know, we were wrong. We fired that guy because he was praying on the job, praying over his food. Because he was listening to a preaching tape while he was eating lunch. Because he's sitting over there quoting Bible verses and singing and acting like Brother Phil all day long. Right, well, I mean, I can take you and show, just go two, two chapters back from what we read. What's that? That's what's usually called the Hall of Faith, the Scriptures. What did those people do? Their faith brought them through tough times so that on the other side, God could be glorified. It's not about what it, I'm sanctified unto Him. He can use me however He wants to. But the last thing I want to do is start giving away them things of the world that used to be so precious to me. Because right. sure. once you give it away, it's not like a real pawn store where you can just go back and get it. The devil's going to destroy that quicker than you can give it to him. It's going to be gone because he doesn't want you to have it back. You're going to have to work again to redevelop that thing. You're, I mean, it's going to take you a whole lot more effort than it did the first time to get back what you had not worth it not a wise investment I mean you can pawn something and go well I just got to go pay him back what I originally and then interest but well, there's always a whole lot more interest when the devil's involved right well what's that mean well in order to pay off the first one you're going to have to barter something else and something else and something else until eventually you're so far out in the world you don't even know how you got there don't even know which way to go to try and find your way back to the things of God. Thankfully, if you yell help, God will come get you. Amen. Amen. But see, Esau, he never did that. A lot of people used to go to church here. They, didn't, they don't, still don't do that. Why? I don't know. I don't know everything. But I do know I don't want it to happen to anybody in here. I do know I don't want it to happen to me. I do know that I want to see that building project happen. I don't want to see it canceled because, well, we've got, a, we got plenty of empty room now. We've got plenty of space now. Now, I want to see God do great things. But in order to do that, we've got to stop trading away the benefits of God, the blessings of God, things that God's given us so that we can be a light into the world and quit trading them off and say, well, I only need to shine this bright so I can trade off these batteries. No, I just want to be the brightest light that I can be. I want to be the saltiest salt that I can be. I want to get as close and as smack dab up next to God as I can, that they can't get to me without feeling the presence of God. That used to be a thing. Very rare nowadays. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.